Democratic and dynamic and don't expect to have a presentation because he will use chalk. <laughs> oh, no, the typology <laughs> at uh, work. Yeah, you <laughs> can take away the... Brilliant, thank you. Okay, um, there's a slight change of gear in this talk because I'm not going to talk about atoms at all, which in a nanotribology conference is a crime, of course. But what I'm trying to do is to actually bridge the gap, which has been mentioned many times between our engineering materials people who do tribology and what happens with this community. Um, and to do that, I want to talk about the phenomenon of plasticity and how it is relevant to um, uh, tribology. And so what I really want to talk about is how you contrast macro and nano friction. And this brings in all these questions like uh, roughness, wear, um, lubrication, and so forth, which are all there. But in addition, how do you control plasticity? And um, there's a kind of little note I've made for myself there, which is about 25 years ago, David Tabor said to me, um, this 1D stuff you're doing in nano is great, but it's useless because you can't do anything two-dimensional. And so he said, you better do something about that. Well, I'm sorry it's taken 25 years, David, but there you go. Um, so what I'm going to discuss is the literal stages of lateral deformation, static friction, which we'll see, energy dissipation, and the tip shape and material properties when you have a system where you know you have some plastic deformation. So this is different from these systems where you just have purely elastic or no deformation change, which is typically the case for atomic force microscopy work. Um, this is going to be an entirely experimental report, which means, of course, um, you can't publish it in physics journals because I don't have lots of models attached to it, so it gets published in other kinds of places, despite what Feynman said there in his lectures to introduction to physics. So let's go. Here we go. Press the right button, hopefully. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just a quick instant review of the old stuff, which you know all about, um, from these two gentlemen here. And, of course, the history of this is um, basically the realization the real area of contact is smaller than the gym. So you know all this. All I want to do here is point out why this is useful and why engineers are still attracted to it. There's five things it does. It explains the fact that low, friction is independent of load. Simple, everyone knows that. Um, gives good typical values, 0.2 for metal, something like that. It gives you a quantitative mechanism for energy dissipation. Indeed, in the old debates about Coulomb, the question was always, why did the energy come back? OK, atomistically, we know about that in phonons. But in the old days, that was a problem, whereas plastic deformation gave you a get-out-of-jail clause there, it's plasticity, and so therefore it dissipates energy. Okay. Um, then, of course, if you reduce the shear strength at the interface, that explains how you reduce the friction, that's lubrication. But perhaps the last one I wanted to mention here, the wear is likely to be proportional to the area of true contact, which means it's inversely proportional to the hardness, which is one of those empirical things that engineers are very keen on, and we shouldn't lose sight of it. Okay, so that was the only reason for mentioning this. Um, there are, of course, problems with this, as we know well, like why is the, it is supposed to be strong contacts, but adhesion is weak, uh, what's going on here? Uh, and, of course, that's essentially because the simple picture of plasticity does not allow for elastic strains in the system, and that is going to break the contacts when they're re-released. This has been known for a long time. There's the whole story of adhesion, which we all know about, the JKR, DMT, and, and, and. Um, there's this index here, which is, for some reason, isn't quite so often mentioned, which is the Fuller-Tabor index, which came just after JKR, Little story here, by the way. David, of course, should have been on the paper with JKR, but he wasn't entirely sure about the business of elastic relaxation of stresses because this was his big thing. So it should have been JKRT, but anyway, whatever. Um, and shortly afterwards, with Keith Fuller, he produced this other thing, which essentially says, if you look at that index, <coughs> it's basically a relationship, a ratio of the adhesive forces, R delta gamma or something related to it, over the size of the roughness times the elastic modulus. So it says, essentially, if you've got systems with high roughness and high elasticity, forget it, you're not going to see adhesion, which is what gave them the get-out-of-jail clause for adhesion. However, the most serious problem with all this, which is why we're all here, is that, essentially, it shoves the problem of lubrication interface slip to somewhere else. A number comes in. And that, of course, is why nanotribology, the area we're working in, is so important, because it exactly asks precisely that question, what is going on? in this area. So that's the importance of the subject area. I just want to do two other reminder things. When you're in continuum mechanics, of course, there's, there's a great classic book by Ken Johnson, you know. There's all sorts of interesting stuff in this, uh, which we may or may not use some of it. But you all know if you take an elastic contact that's in contact and you shear it, there's going to be singularities at the edge, and therefore you're going to partial slip. All this stuff is well known. But I just want to make this cautionary note. That's great if it's purely elastic. But if you have plasticity, 
right? You get blunting of those cracked tips, and in fact, for indents, you don't see this process at all, right? So plastic indents don't actually have that process. So the process of sliding when you've got plasticity is not the same as you would expect from all those elastic classical calculations. And then on top of that, of course, if you should go be so bold, and I'll use a piece of chalk here, if I can find where I put it, get rid of stress strain curves and all that stuff. And if you're working the old days of analytical systems, of course, you either have ideal plasticity, which goes like that, plasticity at all, or you have perfectly elastic systems, which go like that, up and down. Reality, of course, is something which goes up here, like that. Okay? So analytically, those two are great. Uh, this one's a pain in the neck until the world of finite element came. And as we'll see later on, even then, it's still a pain in the neck. Um, but that's reality. So this is the thing that um, David Table produced. Essentially, any system where you have a contact, where you've got some surface pressure, and you add an additional shear stress on top of that, of course, you're going to have to maintain the same plastic yield strain, which means the sum of those two is going to be equal to some value of P0. You unscramble that a little bit using the areas, and you get this equation here, which essentially says the area increases, the area contact area increases as you increase the shear stress. Okay. We'll come back to that later on because we've managed for the first time to actually demonstrate it. Okay, so the key question is this. How do you link this plastic stuff which engineers use with what we're doing in this community here? Well, AFM and surface force apparatus, the classic for this, great stuff. You've got an interface slip. Most of these surfaces are fairly smooth. You can investigate what's happening locally. The fact you can do molecular dynamics is wonderful because you can add chemistry in in some reliable way. And, of course, you've got some sensible way of characterizing local and mixing. So we, feel, we can all feel pretty cheerful about that, okay, with all modeling. But... Some problems with this, or some limitations, it's actually quite hard to represent many L asperities, especially those that are deforming plastically, as we will see. Okay? And of course, you can't do that primarily because it's actually very hard to generate plasticity in systems which are essentially operating with soft springs. What we really want, if we're sitting there with the Spice Girls, what we really, really want <laughs> is something which has these characteristics here, which is you want enough dynamic range, like about 10 to the 6 or something like that in force. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Because then you could bridge the whole gap, measure the sensitivity and so forth, and you can do nanoscale stuff, and you can do large-scale stuff, and you can do the transition between them. Well, we've been working on that for about 20-odd years. It's a complete pain where we are getting there, and I want to explain why this is actually quite difficult. 1D, it's not a serious problem. Okay, this is, sorry, let's, let's start with the AFM side of it. Why is this difficult in the AFM? And there are numerous papers on this subject. It's essentially because you're using a spring-driven device. So to access displacements and stiffness, which is a very far away from the stiffness you happen to have for your spring, whether it be torsional, vertical, or however you configure it, is actually very difficult because the accuracy of the measurement falls away. The sensitivity declines completely, so that's a bit of a problem. Then there's all these other questions. The more dimensions you introduce something, the number of degrees of freedom goes up to the factorial the number of dimensions. Thank God there's only 3D in the world. <laughs> So already for a 3D system, you've got all these rotations coming in as well, which means that coupling between those things in a spring system becomes very important. And this is particularly serious if you're looking at energy dissipations. So it's actually quite hard, if I'm honest here, if I look at the work we're producing in AFM and I try and convince my materials engineering colleagues that we really know about elastic moduli and so forth, they kind of take this skeptical look and say, really? How quantitative is that? Is it really calibrated? Can I put this into my materials and my finite element analysis when you're going to fly the plane? I've calculated on that. Mm, well, I don't know. Okay. So we have to be honest about what that. What we're looking at is qualitative characteristics, not so much quantitative ones. So, as I said, this has been done in 1D. This is what nano is about. And I'm sure this is all familiar to you. So you've got force and some kind of displacement along here, and you load the thing up, and it goes up, and you unload, and it comes back down like that. Okay. Got a that's for some purpose. You've got a spherical, like this. Of course, we all know that you get an initial elastic region, back and up and down there. But after a certain point, you get some plasticity in the area under this. It tells you something about the surface. You've got, and of course, you've got an elastic relaxation here. There's a famous formula there for the stiffness, and of course, you get the indent, and you can either infer, work out the, what the elastic modulus is, if you know what the tip shape is, and if you, don't know, if you know what the elastic modulus is, you can calculate the tip shape. So this combination is used very widely. In fact, the modeling done for this, which was sub, um, summarized by Oliver and Farr, 
some actually astonishing number of citations, I think about 25 or 30,000 or something like that, using this. The depressing thing is if you go and read a sample of these papers and you decide, are they using it properly? <clears throat> Ask some tough questions there. Okay, so let's get on to the meat and potatoes here. We have produced a device which does do this. There's a lot of detail in here which I'm not going to describe, but essentially it takes two systems which are apply a force and measure the resulting displacement. Okay? So with this coil magnet system in the previous slide, that allows you to apply a wide range of forces which are independent of position, apart from the springs in the system, which you know about. Um, and then you can do this in 2D in this particular case. It's done by coupling with some glass blades, which give you flexibility in one dimension um, and rigidity in the other direction. And that gives you reasonable um, minimizing of the, of the coupling across the axes. I'm not going to say this is perfect, but we're talking about very large numbers here for these coupling things. So it's not a real problem in the, what I'm going to describe for you. We're going to use two, three different kinds of samples, two metals and one, um, uh, pu one a few silica there. This all appeared in this paper recently with uh, George Farr and Owen Brazil, who did all the great um, measurements himself. Right, let's get stuck straight in. Um, this is rather a lot in this, but what I'm going to describe, this is the machine at the top there, essentially using vertical and lateral. So you're doing all this stuff in two different dimensions, independently and decoupled. Okay. Um, I'll go into these, but the basic picture is what we're doing, starting off with here, is actually quite a, um, a large radius tip there. It's about one micron. And we're gonna, what we're going to do before anything happens is stick into the surface about 200 nanometers and thereby making a dent in the surface. So you've got some plasticity sitting in there. This is way beyond what happens in normal AFM measurements. Uh, this is too detailed, so I'll go into it in, in piecemeal. Um, essentially what happens, you can do an equivalent of this thing, but laterally. Okay, so instead now doing this vertically, we're doing exactly the same thing laterally, and you can do precisely the same measurement. And essentially what you find is something not too different from that. That's to say, as I apply a lateral force to this system, I get a curve, well, you can see it up there, okay, which essentially says that there's a shape which tells me that I'm actually deforming this thing, and it has to be irreversible of plastic because it's not coming back to the same position. I'm glossing over very briefly the question which may be asked by some people, what happens if we get right down to the bottom of there? I'll come back to that, <laughs> okay? Hard. But essentially, in both these metal materials and in the uh, few silica, you can see roughly the same behavior. You've got some deformation process in the lateral case. Um, if we look a little more, however, beyond this, when we take the deformation much further, of course, this isn't going to be the same as this. At some point, it's going to start to move through a large distance, and this is what you see. Okay, you can see for the three materials here, there's, um, this is the friction coefficient plotted here. And on below here is plotted whoops, the vertical deformation. That's to say, what's happening here, the tip is being indented to the surface. You apply an additional load. It actually sinks in further, okay, which is certain cases. And what you can see in the case of the fused silica, um, it's, it basically moves along a steady curve there. You increase the friction, and it reaches some steady value. And then in the case of the uh, indent depth, it goes in a little bit, but not much. What happens to the metals is much more striking. That's to say, first of all, they sink in quite a lot at the beginning. Then they rise out, depending, as we'll see later on, material properties. But you also see a maximum of friction. This is static friction. So essentially what you've got here is an increase in static friction, purely because of the fact you've deformed the surfaces. You've generated a few little cut for the thing. Okay. And then to get out of that requires some force, which is higher than once you actually start making a continuous groove. Okay? Kind of useful to know if you're worried whether your car tires are going to slip, <laughs> as was mentioned. Okay, so actually, this is a mechanism which doesn't have anything to do with asking hard questions about the chemistry of the surface of the registry or anything. It's something rather simple about the geometry of the system. If you arrange for these deformations, you'll get this for these metallic systems. Okay, so there you can see the two key features. There's a vertical movement, and in addition, there's um, a static friction rather obviously present in that case. Okay, we can follow this a little bit further, just looking at the, um, this is the uh, single crystal nickel. And we're going to follow this out as we go out to the point where essentially you're getting steady grooving or sliding or scratching or whatever you want to call it of the surface. And you can see initial parts of these two bits where you get the relaxation. Two things done here. Um, one, these are AFM profiles of the initial state there. You can see the indent. It gets deeper with a little wall starting to appear on the pink right-hand side there. Sorry, not a pointer. Um, but you can see what's happening in the pink curve there. There's a wall starting to appear on the right. And as you go to this uh, sort of orangey-brown color state, of course, it gets even higher, and it's sunk in even further as you're following this curve. If you push all the way across 
the blue curve on the top, and you look at a profile, you get something like that. And interestingly, the depth of this thing maps pretty well with what you see in the machine itself. This is an AFM cross-section, and you can see the images there in those three cases. So essentially, that tells you that's OK. right? You've got the combined stresses. It gives you this um, <coughs> increase in depth. And then as you come out of it, that is also the point at which you move from static friction to the um, um, kinetic or dynamic, or what you call it, basically moving continuously on the surface. OK. So what I want to do now is come back to this equation, because of course, all this says is the ratio of the forces, the square of them because it's plasticity, um, to the ratio of the area change, A0 over the initial area, divided by that. Now, the nice thing about having stiffness measured continuously in both axes, and in this case we're going to use the vertical one, is you can measure those stiffnesses uh, instead of the areas. You get a fourth power thing, and you've got all those parameters. You can just plot it and measure it. You've done that, and there they are. <laughs> it actually works quite well. So, in fact, what this tells you that for these systems, these certain metallic systems, it actually works also for the fused silica. When you deform the surface plastically like this, and then you move it laterally, you do actually get exactly what you'd expect from standard plasticity theory. That's to say the area increases, depth goes down to some extent. Now, of course, this doesn't go on forever. <laughs> and you can see they all at some point have the um, uh, value of the strain here, the lateral strain, the ratio of the lateral strain and vertical, uh, lateral stress and vertical stress. At some point, it stops, of course, and then it slides off. So what you're looking at here is the initial part of a deformation of a plastic joint, which is then moved laterally by a small amount. And then when you increase that, eventually this obviously breaks down. It also changes a little bit with the initial depth that you make, or the area in the case A here. And of course, if you make shallower and shallower in dents, you can see what's going to happen. <sighs> right? It's going to fall off earlier, and you won't see this process so easily. We'll come back to that later on. Okay. So broadly speaking, what you see is the this behavior, but I've jumped over something here without confessing what's happening. Right? First thing we did, remember, was a round tip like that. We made a crater like that. Okay. Carefully cheated here. As quickly as possible. Tip raise is actually very small. It's a 10 nanometer or that sort of order. So this is actually a. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> but this works basically because in something like that, which is very sharp, you're always going to get some plastic behavior at the tip, okay? With something which is round, there's a risk you're going to move more towards this kind of thing we're familiar with, with uh, certainly weak plasticity and even elasticity. It approaches more towards, as we'll see at the end of the talk, approaches more towards what's familiar in this community. Here, you definitely get plasticity. It's even better than that. You see all the curves sit almost on top of each other, irrespective of the size of the hole you make. That, okay? and that's what you'd expect with a self-similar system, which is what you've got with a, a tip like that. Okay? So this all seems to work quite nicely. Now, at this point, I'd be saying, hey, great, sorted. But one of the troubles with making a new piece of apparatus is that you push it a little bit further and you discover, oh dear, it doesn't seem to quite work as you expected. And of course, if you look at that, you can't really expect it to work perfectly because we know reality contains elasticity. So if you do this now instead of a sharp tip, but instead of that, something which is round, where we know the elastic terms matter, they matter here, but they're not, they're not very scale. Here, they're even more important. And what we find is actually, you don't get this nice behavior. Once you, what you find is that in fact, depending on the material here, and this is another story which I'm not going to, be able to elaborate on, essentially what happens, I'll summarize this very briefly, it's easiest to see in these two sketches on the bottom right there, if you have a system which you've now pushed sideways, right, and it's got very significant elastic stresses pushing back, elastic, then what's going to happen is there's going to be some pushing that way, okay, which if it's a system which has a high um, elastic, has a low uh, get this right, right? A low value of the modulus over hardness, which is the same thing as essentially saying something which is um, uh, highly elastic with not so much plastic uh, energy put into When you deform it, a significant fraction is elastic, which is not true here, but is true here, right, depending on that slope, then you're going to get some process which pushes it back. And in fact, what you see here, as I say, depending on low E over H, that's to say high yield strain, what you find is the back follows the front, okay? And when you're then measuring the vertical contact area, you find you don't get the behavior you had before. What you find is it follows on there, whereas in the materials which are high, you have a hitch, that's low yield strain, 
you find, in fact, the back seems to break away, and this changes the way in which it moves into the surface and which, in which you get a contact area, uh, real contact area in the system. This is quite a complicated story, and I'm not going to say much more about it because there's large tracks that we still don't understand, okay, and uh, there's some issues with it. Uh, not in the experiments, by the way. It's more in our understanding. And we know that the yield strain has some effect there, but it's actually quite difficult to uh, model that. Um, in fact, I think there may be... Yes, we did do one finite element simulation for this, which broadly shows the describing behavior you've seen there. As you change the E over H ratio, you can change these curves. You get behavior which shows that initial rise there. But I'm, I'm not going to stress this because... Um, in fact, there's quite a lot of things in what we're seeing experimentally which this simply, simply cannot capture. Right? We're going to need more information about what's happening, not least about the very thing that nanotribology is good at. When you do these things, you're making various model assumptions about what the interface, um, interface shear strength is. Okay? You either use zero or you use something or you use some model or other. And we find it's horribly sensitive to that when you're doing a finite element analysis in this thing. And we're not in a position yet to have a definitive answer. Maybe. Some folks out here will take this experimental data and figure out what's happening in this case. And I want to stress that because the, what's happening in the interface here really does matter, as we'll see in the few remaining slides that I've got. Okay? So, let's move on. So, this is a kind of a semi-summary of where we are. What we've seen is you make a hole, right? you apply some lateral stress, the thing goes into the surface a little bit further. This is actually from Ken Johnson's book, his work in the 90s, on ideal plasticity, the slip line field theory. I don't think anybody does that anymore. <laughs> it's kind of stuff. And essentially what you can see happens is that you generate on one side a wedge of material. In fact, there's a whole engineering industry in this because if you get the angles right, this thing doesn't turn into a blob. It turns into a chip, okay, which comes away, which is what's happening in metal cutting. Okay. There's a whole raft of things that you can talk about there for shaping materials and so on. But the precedent I want to make here is that that modeling, zip line plastic, modeling has its own serious limits, despite the fact you've got these quantitative things like the angle of the uh, uh, cutting edge and so forth. There's never any friction drop in the whole thing, and you don't see a lot of the dynamics that we see in the plots I've shown you. And in fact, this has been known for a long time, and David Tabor suggested what's actually happening in this case is the reason you get a transition is because the edge, previous slide, probably lose it here, the trailing edge here, or rather the, the front edge, this part down on the blue uh, right hand side there um, is actually starting to slide at the interface. See what's happened here is it's frictionless. Okay. We've got to do some more. We've got to insert some nanotribology into this uh, macro scale friction. Um, th this is a good moment also to mention, of course, Mark Robbins, a late colleague, um, who, of course, was very active in this whole business, um, and particularly his observation that the uh, interface layer, presence of a carbonaceous interface layer actually matters quite a lot, and this is something that uh, David suspected long ago. And it's, of course, interesting to see that, uh, of course, Mark's married to Pat Vladimir Grigan, who you all know is a colleague of Jacob Israelvili, <laughs> with whom I remember sitting in David Tabor's office discussing many things together with both students. That was an interesting experience, too, with Jacob. But essentially, you can see the threads connecting here. It's good that all this communication is going on, as we all have here, so it's excellent to see that happening. The question is, is there some evidence which we can add from this experiment to say, well, is there actually some slip occurring in the interface at this point? And of course, this is the point at which it took some more recent data, measuring at the same time the phase angle between the oscillatory force we're applying and the dis displacement response. And of course, as that increases, it's an obvious signal of dissipative energy. You see what's happening here, right, in the case of the, um, uh, case of the um, um, single crystal nickel, You've got that falling in, and then it starts rising out again. But look at that. The phase angle rapidly rises, very rapidly, by a large amount, exactly at the moment when you'd expect the thing to start to slip. Okay? And as you carry on slipping, there it is steadily giving you a steady signal in the whole thing. Okay? This applies actually for all materials. If you, once you start that constant sliding, essentially you see a rapid increase in the dissipation energy observed from the phase angle of the applied load. Okay? So this is clear signal you've got interface sliding, and you've got a way of measuring that. So that localized interface we've been talking about is, of course, critical in this case. You can see evidence for this related. Notice how when you get the initial sink in, the initial static friction, there isn't any. Right? That force is generated essentially by geometry that you've made with the plastic deformation. It only comes about when that interface starts sliding. Okay. So that's, um, that's one point. Now, I want to finish 
Yeah, I'm getting on okay here. Um, with a, one more piece of data, because of course, there's a little summary for you of what we've said so far. Tip rises out of the surface once you start transition to this ploughing or scratching, or whatever you want to call it. And at that point, the energy dissipation observed from modulation rapidly increases very significantly. There's other implications of this, by the way. It implies that even in systems which are deforming plastically, like scratch process, it's that interfacial energy sliding which is actually the dominant process, which, from the point of view of nanotribologists, should be mightily encouraging, because it means even in stuff where you're causing grooves in surfaces, right, what you're measuring at that single atom and molecular scale really matters, despite the fact that it appears to be a purely plastic process. So that's very encouraging. The question is, can we scale this thing down, down here, or rather with the radius, um, and see what's seen in the kind of typical AFM SFA experiments. And of course, I wouldn't be standing here if we hadn't done that. <laughs> okay. So there's three examples here taken from a, a small radius tip, <coughs> a Berkovich tip, which of course was an even smaller radius, and we deliberately chose a much larger radius tip. And you can see what happens here. As you increase the radius or you decrease the applied load on the thing, essentially what happens is these curves which show you, for example, you've got a sinking in or you've got an increase in friction or whatever, turn into something which is much more familiar, which is to say you have an initial slope and then it turns over to a steady friction, which is what you see in a typical AFM type of experiment. There's a whole map of these things here. Um, let me see what other things. Um, that pretty much says what you need. The one on the bottom right there, for example, is essentially the sort of thing you'd see. You can see there's a region which is... Um, bigger, you get a kind of plateau of some kind due to the fact you've got a deeper hole or a larger load, and it takes longer to reach that steady state process. But essentially, in the case of the large uh, radius, which is essentially one where you're getting minimal plasticity, in fact, zero plasticity, you get something which much more closely resembles what we see in AFM. I should say, by the way, that um, there's, I've, in the previous few graph, there it is, this one I've casually said that it's plastic or non plastic. You can justify this. Exactly, if you do these measurements in normal indentation, <coughs> and for all the ones which we know are purely elastic, this is exactly what you get. They come up and they come exactly back down the same line. Okay? So you've got independent evidence that there is no significant plasticity in those cases that show that behavior. So that's essentially, you can bridge the gap. I would be dishonest if I were to tell you this problem is entirely solved. <laughs> right. um, there are some rather strange things happening when you get a very small loads here, which again, what you'd expect in nanoscale stuff. Uh, one of which is that, and I might as well tell you this, right? One of which is that actually, when you use small, very small ships, the process is laterally elastic too. If you're a person into plasticity, this is bad news. Right? Shouldn't happen, right? But it does, okay? That's one of the reasons why the finite element is actually a problem, because you put in a constitutive relationship which governs the material, but doesn't govern the whole story. So something's going on there which tells you when you make very small lateral displacements with a plastic hole, remember? I'm not talking about the equivalent of AFM. There's a region where you get elasticity. It's even worse than that. You can look at the lateral stiffness and the vertical stiffness, and it gives you a really nice Poisson's ratio number, <laughs> which works really well. So clearly it is elastic. I don't have a good explanation for that in terms of constituted relationships, but it tells you the kind of complications. So if I go back to that summary here, okay, Essentially, with these plastic dents, you can quite easily get static friction, high kinetic friction, which is useful, and it's essentially associated with the fact you've made a plastic indentation. You don't require any special magic chemistry or time evolution of anything like to, to do that. You can just get it straight. It's probably why they have hard additives in car tires. I don't know. I'm not sure about that, but, you know, there's that sort of thing. For initial lateral loading, you get this simple plastic junction growth that I described for um, basically essentially metallic materials. Uh, for materials... Um, which have a significant elastic recovery at the, the trailing edge, you get a more complicated picture, but essentially you can deal with it. And the important thing here at the end is that the transition from static sink into kinetic sliding is affected by, directly by the interface friction. You can see that in terms of the energy dissipation. It's also affected by the tape sh shape of the tip. That angle actually matters. So the geometry of these particles, I'm sorry to say, sorry to have to say this, but they do actually matter. <laughs> the shape of the tip matters. And of course, this E over H ratio. So uh, there's a kind of quick run through plastic deformation, which is a nasty subject, but it does actually relate quite nicely to what we're doing here. And so I want to finish with a couple of slides. One, some of you may have been to that famous meeting in America. That's the view, the view from the terrace. Uh, this is partly a memoriam of another colleague who left us a while ago, Sanjay Biswas, who we were organizing. Um, essentially, the meeting was organized because of their 
partly because it's a nice place, and it's, of course, that's why it's nice to be here in, <laughs> in Trieste too, <laughs> um, but also because there's an old, um, there's an old, <laughs> there's an old, um, in the 1930s, apparently Bowden did kind of publicity, science and publicity was done quite a lot even then, and he was on the radio trying to explain why it is that their new theory of friction involving multiple asperities was relevant. And he said, basically, if you take Austria and you turn it upside down and put it on top of Switzerland, the area of um, true contact is going to be rather small. I think he was referring to physical contact rather than political, but I'll leave that question to you. <laughs> Thank you. Nobody likes plasticity. Okay. <laughs> Everybody agrees on this problem. Of okay, <laughs> this is important. Although, for uh, the happy word of graphene, this becomes less important. Fortunately, yes. So, okay, there, uh, there is a question. So I believe you said the, uh, well, what was the smallest size curvature radius of the various tests? I guess, was it the Berkovich? Yes, with like that's a, right. And that's about 100 nanometers or yeah, something like that? Yeah, maybe less than that even in the clean, clear ones. I, I'm wondering if any of these exper uh, experiments would be affected by the fact that it's around that length scale or below you start getting these scale effects in plasticity uh, because of dislocation starvation and... Uh, yeah, and many, also, more importantly, as we realized recently, it's strain rate that matters for those. And, of course, that was the point originally that the interface region um, is, of course, not typical of the bulk. And that's, again, another reason we described earlier on. I think it's, it's broadly true that the sharpest of these tips will just about explore that region. But the problem is, it, as we've discovered in recent times, it isn't just you know, the so-called yield strength change due to dislocation interaction. The strain rate matters a great deal at that point. And I think this is one of the things we should take into account when we're thinking about simulations. The fact that there's a time scale difference between what's happening in the experiments and the mod simulations is actually still pretty serious. And a, there's a very strong strain rate effect in all of these things, especially in metal. And one other follow-up, if I may, is since you can have the two-dimensional uh, capability, could you apply this to, say, an anisotropic material like graphite or some layered material Absolutely. so that you and in particular it would be nice I think to use this to really show what the elastic just the elastic properties are because I think people often don't use the contact mechanics properly for the anisotropic case but but the solutions exist and you could probably show what yes. the right way is to do You're it. absolutely right I mean this is essentially a new machine we just haven't got around to doing it so all suggestions really welcome if you've got a problem you've got burning a hole in your theoretical pocket you why don't you do an experiment on this Please let us know. <laughs>